You probably took note of the fact that we used to just be the Jefferson Innovation Speaker Series, and now we're the Independence Jefferson Speaker Series, in part because of our collaboration with Independence Blue Cross. And the person that I'm going to introduce to you in a minute is uh, the person who leads the effort internal to Blue Cross to innovate across the multiple silos of activity. So the total population of Blue Cross employees that are part of the sort of core family and the affiliates, it's over 8,000 folks. And so Michelle Histand, who will be speaking to you in a moment, is um, the person who is tasked with making that happen. And as our team will be happy to tell you, building a change of culture and innovation is um, its challenging, it's cool, it's exhausting, it's wonderful, it's, so, it's pretty much a roller coaster ride, and, uh, and it turns out that uh, it, it's true in academe and it's also true in corporate America in Blue Cross. So uh, with, uh, with that, let me introduce you to one of the most talented, remarkable women that I've had the opportunity to meet and work with, Michelle Histand. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, guys. Oh, I'm very loud. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, so I was putting these slides together trying to think about how I could keep you interested. So I hope that I've succeeded. I don't want to bore you for the next hour. So I thought what we would do, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, how we think about innovation and then do a lot of case studies to tell you a lot about how we've been applying it. Because I think that, y you know, you talk about it and um, until you can really hear how it works and, and how you apply it, it doesn't really hit home, right? So we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, I think I'm going to... Can you, can you still hear me if I do this? Yeah, okay, I hate to stand like right there. I like to move. I have a lot of energy, I'm a little hyper. Um, okay, so uh, let me start with some background on Independence Blue Cross. We're a national brand. Um, the fact I like on this slide is that one in three Americans carry a blue card. So we're really excited about that. There are uh, 37 Blue Cross Blue Shields across the country. Um, some of these numbers are a little old, but you get the idea. We're a pretty big presence across the country. And uh, locally, we've been in the area for over 75 years. And the fact that I like here is that we're number one preferred brand in our region. So uh, with being around for 75 years, you can imagine that innovation maybe doesn't come supernaturally, right? We are a bit risk averse kind of by nature. So when we think about innovation, it's a little bit harder to get people moving that direction. Uh, so I'll tell you kind of the way we've started to think about that and, and do that as we've moved into innovation. So, so why is innovation important? Uh, well, for us, innovation is important for, for many, many reasons. Uh, I'll start by a demonstration. Could somebody uh, lend me a Blockbuster card? Could, oh, 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 right, you can, because they're gone, right? Uh, how about anybody dropping off film on the way home? The, do, you, do you remember the drive? Well, some of us remember the drive-in kiosk, right? And you would drop the film off. Is that happening? Anyone doing that today? Probably not, right? So innovation is important because of businesses like Blockbuster and Kodak who were at the top of their game and now they're no longer because they got complacent, right? They thought that, well, we're doing things well, we're really killing it, so I don't have to worry. We don't have to do anything differently. And that's actually not true at all. And we recognize that. Certainly with healthcare reform, we really need to think about things differently, right? So traditionally, we were a B2B company. We were selling to businesses, and uh, we were a preferred brand, and we didn't have to worry about uh, as much worry about what consumers thought because we were selling to businesses, and this was the choice your HR department gave you. You can enroll in Independence Blue Cross this year, and that's what happens. Well, now that's really different for us, right? Because now we're selling directly to consumers, so people have choice, and they have to think about where they want to enroll and who they want to go with. So it's really important for us to be innovative and stay on top of things so that we can compete in that kind of a marketplace. It's really a different world now, right? So that's why we started to think about innovation. And the way we think about innovation is really in two key ways. So we think about it from the investments and sponsorships angle. So we do direct and indirect investments through a strategic innovation portfolio that we run. My counterpart actually runs. And then we're doing a lot of sponsorships out in the community where it makes sense. So getting involved in things that make sense. I think that when we think about innovation, very often we think about technology, right? And Technology is one piece of innovation, but we're thinking a lot about innovation from, from a bigger picture. So there's the technology piece and the startup piece, but we're also thinking a lot about culture and capability, and that's really where my world is. So culture and capability, meaning 
how do we be innovative, right? Uh, innovate, innovation is such a buzzword now. We use it all the time. I think there's a car rental company called Innovation Car Rental now. I'm like, what's, what's that look like? How's that innovation going? So uh, innovation is just used all the time. So what we're thinking about is how do we actually do it? How do we approach it? And how can we do things differently? Because we have folks, we have a lot of, we call them lifers, who have worked with us for 30 years. Um, they came right out of high school and they stay until they're ready to not work anymore, right? So how do we get people like that to innovate? What does that mean? And then the culture piece is shifting it so that people are a little more open to innovating. Um, something that happens a lot in our hallways is, oh yeah, we tried that 10 years ago, it didn't work, so we don't wanna go down that path again, right? Oh yeah, that's never gonna work, we need a lot of resources. And you're like, well, I've only just gotten three words about the idea out of my mouth, right? So how do you know it won't work until we explore it a bit more? But we're great at shutting things down, kind of as adults in general, but certainly in corporate America. So these are the two ways we're thinking about innovation from the investment side and then from the culture and capability side. So what is innovation? Uh, so we thought the first thing we had to do was think about what innovation actually means. So what do you guys think of when you think of innovation? I was gonna have you text in, but our technical difficulties are not allowing this. So um, one word, what do you think of? Anything? Bueller? Yeah? Yeah, Silicon Valley, that comes up a lot. Our CEO has been saying, we want Philadelphia to be the next Silicon Valley. And we're like, or we could just be Philadelphia and be really cool, right? So Silicon Valley comes up a lot. Um, Apple comes up a lot, right? What else? Shout them out. Anything else that you think of when you think of innovation? New, what's that? Creativity. Creativity is one of the first things, right? Uh, creativity comes up a lot. I'm actually uh, doing a lecture tonight about creativity versus innovation and what the differences are, right? So we think about creativity. We think about anything new, right? So innovation can mean a whole bunch of different things. And we started by coming up with a common definition for innovation and how we think about innovation. And that is the habit of continually doing things in new ways. So it sounds kind of crazy, right? Because new ways and habit almost sound like they contradict each other. So how can it be a habit if it's new ways, right? Um, would you guys just for a second stand up and shake out your arms, shake them out. And just cross your arms. Sorry for the recording. <laughs> uh, okay, cross your arms. Yeah, so we do this all the time. We stand this way. It's pretty, pretty common. So can you shake them back out and cross them the other way? Right, right. What is happening? Whose arms are on my body, right? That's what it feels like. You guys can sit back down. So that feels crazy, right? When you cross your arms the opposite way, it feels like you're wearing somebody else's arms, right? It doesn't, it doesn't feel normal. That's kind of what innovation feels like. It feels really weird at first. If you crossed your arms that way 41 times, it would start to feel normal because that's how many times it takes to start creating a habit, allegedly. I don't know, I'm making these things up. But no, it, it's a fact. <laughs> So if you did that over and over and over, you would start to form a habit. It would start to feel less weird, right? So that's why we say it's the habit of doing things in new ways because the more we start to do things in new ways, the more we become comfortable with not knowing what the outcome will be or with trying something new or with knowing something might fail, it becomes a lot easier, right? When I came into this job, I did not have a design background. I did not have an innovation background. I had a training background. And everything we did, I was like, oh, guys, I don't know if it's going to work. We should really talk about this more. And now I know nothing we do will work and it's totally fine, right? We're going to figure it out. So we're very, very often doing things on the fly and iterating because it will all work out in the end and we'll figure it out. And that's the best way to figure it out, right? So, so that's, that's how innovation feels, certainly to a 75-year-old company, right? It feels really uncomfortable and we have to keep at it. So that's why we use the definition that we use, the habit of continually doing things in new ways. Uh, because we think that's how you're going to learn and be comfortable with, with, with being different and innovative. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, we funnel this all through what we call human-centered innovation. And it's all about putting people back into the center of everything we do. Uh, very, very often, businesses will say, well, we know what our people need. We know what our members need or what our customers need. Do you think we do? Probably a lot of the time we don't, right? Because we're looking at it from the business angle. Sometimes we've stepped out of the customer's shoes and we have our business hats on and we're kind of saying, well, 
this is how this system will work, or this is what makes the most sense, but we're not right in, in the right frame of mind for a customer and how it would make sense for them. So it's putting people back in the center of everything we do. This is also a methodology called design thinking. Uh, does anybody know design thinking? Anybody familiar with that? Yeah, so design thinking, it's kind of catching on now, right? So design thinking, all about putting people in the center of the design, whatever that design is. Uh, so what does design have to do with healthcare? Uh, I think that design sometimes sounds like this squishy, soft thing. People are like, oh, 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 design, do you guys, you guys draw with markers a lot, right? Yeah, we do draw with markers a lot, right? We sketch things out a lot, but there's a reason for that. There's a method to the madness. So design actually means a lot to healthcare, especially right now. Um, we actually, Jefferson just sponsored a talk by Bruce Mal, a designer. And he said something that I, I thought was so profound, and that's that nowadays almost everything is designed. And it actually took me back to a ninth grade earth science class. And ninth grade was a really long time ago for me. So the fact that I've remembered this for all of these years says something. Uh, I had a teacher for earth science, Mr. Capitasto, <laughs> who challenged us as students to think of one thing in the world that doesn't change. So one thing that doesn't change. And I thought about it. Uh, literally since ninth grade, and I still can't think of anything. Because we were saying, like, rocks! Oh, oh, wait, they erode, right? So there's nothing that doesn't change. And very soon, I think we're going to be to that point with design, where everything is designed. And very, very often, it's unconscious, right? So when you're setting up your kitchen, when you move into a new house, uh, where you put your forks in relation to the dishwasher because you're going to unload the dishwasher. You're designing your experience of unloading the dishwasher, whether you know it or not, right? So everything you do, you're designing. Um, when you wake up on Saturday morning, I always say to my husband, what's the game plan for this weekend? I'm designing the experience my kids will have over the weekend, right? So everything is being designed. The big thing to think about is are we designing it in a way that makes sense? Are we designing things in a way that's optimal for whoever that user is, whether it's you or whether it's somebody else? And that's why design's so important in healthcare because it's been a designed experience from the get-go, right? Where you guys have your waiting room set up and how the chairs are set, it was designed by somebody. Now, it may or may not be optimal, but it's designed, right? Every experience we have has been designed in some way, either intentionally or unintentionally. So now we want to get really intentional about the way we're designing healthcare, right? We want to get really intentional about the experiences our folks are having, whether they're a patient or whether they're interacting with the insurer. We want it to be really, really intentional and think about how we design the right experience for the right outcomes, for the best outcomes, right? So I want to talk about the way we think of design and design thinking. And what I thought I'd do is tell you guys, these are kind of the five steps that we use, sort of the tools when we think about design thinking. And I thought with each one, I'll tell you a bit about what it is and then give you a case study of how we've used it. Um, and also a bit about how it's been used in the world. Because I, again, I think this kind of drives it home rather than just talking about tools. I want to tell you how it's been applied. So these are the five things that we think about most often. Uh, empathy, and another way we talk about that is insights. Framing, so framing the problem. Ideation, I think everyone's pretty familiar with. We love to jump to ideas. We always like to go right to how we're going to fix something, right? Uh, and then prototyping and testing and refining. So the first one I'm going to talk about is empathy. So empathy, uh, another word for empathy that we use sometimes is insights. Uh, so having empathy for your users and understanding what people are going through and what they need, right? So this up here is the segue. Anybody ride their segue here? Mm -mm. Okay, just checking. Um, maybe you'll write it to develop your film later. Uh, so the, the inventor of the Segway uh, said that the Segway will do to the car what the car did to the horse and carriage. Yeah, uh, Dean Kamen, him up there, he thought the Segway was going to revolutionize transportation. Yeah, so this is an amazing example of somebody who came up with a really cool idea. And it, it, it's a cool idea, right? It's a cool invention. But there was no need for it, right? He didn't think about how people would actually use the Segway. So you can't ride it when it's raining. Well, you can. You'll be very wet. Uh, if you have groceries, eh, it might not work out for you. If you want to wave to neighbors passing by, eh, it's questionable if you're going to stay on there, right? So a lot of issues with the Segway. But it was a classic example of somebody who did not have the empathy or insight. He didn't know what the users would need this for. Why would you need a Segway? So what, it's become amazingly popular with mall cops, 
Yeah, so there was a need there, I suppose. Uh, perhaps not at the rate that he created these things, but there was a need for mall cops. And then you see the tours. Have you seen the people touring in the city? Never get stuck behind one in your car. It's maddening. Uh, so, so the segue was an example of where there was no empathy for something. There was no understanding of the need or of the users or what they really wanted, right? And this is the opposite. So the flip side of that is starting with empathy. And very, very often, it comes from your own insight. So I have a friend, uh, Jen Groover, who invented this. And I'll tell you what it is in a minute. Jen is a mom of twins. And she had her two young girls out of the supermarket. And uh, I don't know if the ladies in the room have big bags. I carry a purse about this big. Why wouldn't I? Uh, and you have tons and tons of stuff in there, right? So she's digging in the supermarket for her credit card. The babies are crying. She's trying to pay. It spills all over the floor. And she's mortified, and she's cleaning it up. So based on that insight and that need, Jen invented this. It's called the butler bag. It's an insert to handbags. And you can see it really does a lovely job of organizing all of your materials in your purse. It's a million dollar business, right? So it started though with the need. It started because she was having this challenge with her purse and her kids. So very, very often the best inventions don't start with a really cool invention. They start with a need. What, where's the problem? Where's the gap? What do we need to solve for, right? Um, and how do we understand that and, and really understand who our users are and, and what their needs are? So the example I want to talk about for independence was our Hispanic consumer strategy. So this is my favorite project from 2015. Uh, in the past, our Hispanic consumer strategy has been to translate everything into Spanish. Awesome strategy. Uh, yes, we do need to translate things into Spanish. Yeah, but it, it doesn't stop there, right? There's more than that. There's more that our Hispanic consumers need than their language, right? So this year, no, last year, because it's 2016 now, last year we, uh, we embarked on a project to really understand our Hispanic consumers better. And we had about 15 of our Hispanic associates go out into their neighborhoods and interview and talk to people who lived there. And they interviewed each other to understand their perceptions on healthcare. And they talked to their family members. And we were able to really understand some of the things driving our Hispanic consumers when it comes to healthcare. Um, one of the things that we found out is that when it comes to decisions, uh, healthcare or any other ones, it's a family decision for the Hispanic consumer, right? So I have three kids. I would rather die than take them grocery shopping or anywhere where I'm actually trying to get anything done. Our Hispanic consumers, that's not true. They take their kids everywhere. They take their whole families, right? So that was an insight that we didn't have. And here's where it translated for us. When we have enrollment, we have two chairs set up, one for the consultant and one for the person enrolling. How's that going to work for our Hispanic consumers and their families? Not so well, right? So that gave us insight that we need to change that. Another really interesting insight was uh, the Hispanic consumers we talked to tend to seek care in a pharmacy setting before a traditional doctor's office because it's more informal. Well, that's really interesting for us to know because then we can meet them where they are, right? So the Hispanic consumer strategy allowed us to, this project rather, allowed us to get insights into the people that we were trying to solve for. Uh, so this was a really interesting one for me, I thought. And I, I just love that idea of going back to your users and asking them, what's important to you instead of us deciding, right? Oh, yeah, translate into Spanish, we'll be good. Well, not so much, right? So that's what empathy is all about. It's really understanding your users, making sure that you're getting in there and knowing what their needs are. And sometimes it starts with you. Sometimes it's, where do I have a gap? What do I wish were different? Um, when I call into customer service at uh, a popular cable company down the street, what do I wish were different? And, and, and am I solving that issue? Or what can I do to solve that issue? Or, or can I create something that solves that issue, right? So that's what empathy is all about. The next one we're going to talk about is framing. And this one is actually really, really big. Framing is all about framing and understanding the problem and doing scoping. Because so often we're jumping to ideas. We're given a challenge and it's like, oh, we need to come up with a way to uh, make this more interesting. Oh, here are all the reasons. Here are all the ways we're going to do it. We're going to come up with a million ideas to make something more interesting. But first, we have to step back and understand, is that really the right thing to solve for? Is that really what we want to solve for, right? So uh, framing, if I ask you guys five plus five, if I frame the question this way, how many answers are there? One, unless you're doing that really weird new math that's out in the elementary schools, but typically it's one, right? Five plus five, the answer's not one, it's 10. There's one answer, right? If I frame the problem this way, 
there are a lot more answers, right? I can come up with a lot more answers. So it's all about how I ask the question, how I frame the problem. And in design thinking, that's one of the main tenets. How are you framing the problem? And are you solving for the right thing? Because very, very often you're not. So the example I want to talk about is from the 1970s. Procter & Gamble was scrambling to come up with a new soap. Colgate had put out a bar, a green bar, Irish Spring, yeah? And it was flying off the shelves. And Procter & Gamble was kind of going, oh no, what are we gonna do? We have to come up with a bar with a green stripe. And this is what they were working on. This is a true story. They were working on how would they create a green stripe bar that could compete? And they had a consultant come in who said, wait a minute guys, back it up a little bit, right? Why do you need to have a bar with a green stripe? What you're really trying to do, what you might want to think about, is how you create a more refreshing soap. So looking at it at a broader lens, you don't need a bar with a green stripe. Who cares if it's a green stripe? You need something that's more refreshing that can compete with this new soap, right? So this is what came out of it, Coast. Is Coast still around? Anybody use Coast this morning? I did. Uh, so, so Coast came out of that challenge because they were looking at it very myopically. It was, they were looking at how do we compete with this one bar, but if you back it up, right? So that's what framing the problem is all about. And the example I want to give you guys uh, comes from one we just did, wrapped up a uh, little, little earlier in 2015. Uh, uh, we were looking at how we could create loyalty in our healthy members. So healthy members. Right? We were looking at, uh, for the people who never use their card, who never pull out their insurance card, when it comes time to enroll, what will make them stick with independence? Why will they stay with us if they're never using their card, if they're never pulling it out? Because the perceived value is that card, right? That's the only thing you get when you enroll in insurance. You get a card. So if you're not using it, how do you feel like you're getting value from the product, right? And that's what we started to look at. Well, two things that we had to step back and reframe. The first was how we thought about healthy members. Because as we got probably about three weeks into the project, we started to have a conversation. And I have someone on my team who goes to her workout studio every day, sometimes twice a day. She's eating kale and quinoa, and she's healthy. And then you have me. I'll call myself the just getting by. I'm healthy. I don't use my coverage. I don't go to the doctor often. I go to my physical. I am not eating kale, sadly, unless it's covered in chocolate. I'm not going to my workout studio. I'm, I'm getting by. I'm healthy. But I don't really do anything to continue that, right? Don't judge. Uh, okay, so, so we had to first think about how are we thinking about healthy, right? We had to reframe the healthy. So then we thought, well, there's actually two groups of people we're talking about. We're talking about the really, really healthies and the just getting bys. Welcome to my group. Uh, then the second thing we found out as we started to do interviews and talk to folks, the men in particular, we found out that we were trying to engage them. How do we engage them with their, with their insurance? How do we engage them with us? You know what we found out? They don't want to be engaged. What they actually want to do is have a product that works when they need it and use it when they need it and never have to think about it again. Yeah? So we had to reframe it. Maybe it's not how we engage them. We had to re re reframe it to how do we make the experience so simple and seamless that once they're enrolled, they never have to think about us, particularly at enrollment when they just have to stay enrolled. They don't have to do anything else, right? So we had to reframe the problem. We, we actually started thinking, we want to engage. And then we found out, no, that's not what we want to do. We want to leave them alone and make sure they're good and they're happy and they have what they need when they need it, yeah? So that's all about framing the problems, just really understanding what you're solving for and why. Uh, the next one is ideation. Ideation doesn't need a whole lot of introduction because everyone loves ideation. It's so fun to come up with ideas, right? Uh, so the way we think about ideation, there's a term called divergent thinking, which is coming up with as many solutions as possible for a given problem, right? So we use divergent thinking all the time. And some of the tenets of this are everything is in. There are no constraints. So we throw out if the system can do it. We throw out if we've tried it 10 years ago. We throw out if this is something that might require a lot of resources. And we get all of those ideas out on the table. The other thing we do is we break assumptions. So very, very often when we're solving for something, we have a ton of assumptions about that problem and we don't even realize it, right? So if we were designing a restaurant, we would assume there has to be seating. That's just something that's in your head because you've been to restaurants and there's always seating and you assume there has to be tables and chairs. So when we break assumptions, we say, well, wait a minute. What if there wasn't seating? What if this restaurant was one uh, where you dance when you eat? 
Is it crazy? Yeah, it's crazy. But it might lead you to an idea that's groundbreaking, right? That you come up with something completely crazy and new. So we break assumptions because very often they're holding us back and we don't even know it. And then the other thing is we always do it in groups. So you can, you can do silent brainstorming yourself and come up with a number of ideas. It will explode into many, many, many more ideas when you get into groups because you build on each other's ideas, right? So you'll have just a, a sliver of something. You know, I was thinking there might be something around dancing. And then somebody else in the group goes, oh, yeah, yeah, you know what? I was just at a cafe, and they had swing lessons in the back. Oh, that makes me think, and then you start to build. And that's how you get the greatest ideas, right? By building on each other's ideas, jumping in. Uh, so I'll talk about ideation. This one is, is one of my favorites. We were charged with uh, coming up with a way to go out and reach out to consumers. So as healthcare reform was, was coming onto the scene, we had to go out and we had to educate consumers about insurance and about healthcare and about healthcare reform. And we had to do it in a way that was engaging and that was exciting because I don't know if you know, insurance isn't super exciting. Sorry to break the, the excitement there, but it's true. Not super exciting, right? So we had to think of a way to engage people um, in a way that would make them care what we were telling them, make them care about healthcare reform. Uh, we were going to be going out to community events. We go out to community events all the time. So when someone's at the Kennett Square Mushroom Festival, why are they going to want to talk to us? Well, we went through the first step that I talked about. We started to think about, well, what are people's needs and what do people like? People love competition. Um, I don't know if you've seen when they're giving away like free t-shirts somewhere. People will kill each other for a free t-shirt. You're like, what's happening? It's an ugly t-shirt. I don't, what's, what's going on, right? But it's true. People love competition. So it was one insight that we found. People really like competition. Uh, they also like the opportunity to win free stuff. So we came up with hundreds, literally hundreds. We had about 40 associates working on this challenge, and we came up with hundreds of ideas. And then we narrowed it down. So we were, we were divergent. We thought of all of these ideas, and then we came back down. We got a little convergent and came down to one idea, and that was this. Uh, this is called the Independence IQ. It's a game show that pops off of a truck when we set up at community events. And people can play to win free prizes. And the questions, it's a Jeopardy-style game, the questions are all around healthcare reform and healthcare in general. Right? So you can win a t-shirt by answering the right questions and people love it. So this is something that came out of that method of divergent thinking where we presented, we came up with hundreds, presented about 10, and this was the one that really hit home for the marketing team. So this is the one that we went with. How you guys doing, okay? Yeah, okay, just checking on you, checking on time. All right, cool, so the next one is prototyping. Um, prototyping is super, super important. It's all about making or uh, explaining your idea. And I first want to talk about uh, Lost in Translation is not just a Bill Murray movie, right? It's actually also the reason a lot of ideas don't happen. If you don't explain an idea well, you don't have a great chance of having it come to fruition, right? So um, I've actually found this challenge in my personal life. I, I will say, I like to decorate, right? So I will redecorate my house constantly. And I'll say to my husband, listen, I was going to, I was going to rearrange the bedroom. I was going to flip this, put the bookshelves over here. And he's like, I, that, that's a terrible idea. It's not going to work. These are all the reasons it won't work. So what I do now is I wait until he's out of town. This happened yesterday. True story. You can come to my house and see it. Uh, I wait until he's out of town for work. And then I rearrange the bedroom. I did it yesterday. And then when he comes home, he says, oh, this looks great. Yeah, because he needed to see it, right? I'm explaining it, and he doesn't get it. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. He's not, he's not that kind of a learner. He can't understand or visualize the way that I can. And then he sees it, and he's like, oh, yeah, this is great. You're a genius. I know, right? So that's why it's really, really important to prototype, right? So uh, Jeff Hawkins developed the Palm Pilot way, 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 way back, right? He prototyped the Palm Pilot with a block of wood, he created a block of wood, he carved a block of wood that was about the size of a Palm Pilot that it would be, and he carried it around in his shirt pocket for a couple of weeks. And when somebody said, hey, are you free for lunch next week? He would pull out the block of wood. Let me check my schedule. Boop, 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 boop. And he'd look at the block of wood. So he probably looked insane. But he did it to see if it was reasonable. Would, I, would somebody carry this thing around? Would somebody pull it out to consult it? Was it a reasonable thing to assume, right? So he's prototyping by carrying a block of wood around. You can prototype in a million ways. It depends what you're trying to prototype, right? So it could be, uh, you can prototype through storytelling. 
You can prototype through acting out a service. But you have to prototype to show people what it is you're trying to accomplish so that you can actually go for it and test. And that's the next piece we're going to talk about, testing. Uh, but prototyping allows people to see what your idea is really all about and what it means. Yeah? Makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, one of the prototypes that we did, we had a challenge to think about wellness in a new way internally. Uh, and we wanted to think about how to increase wellness in our associates with the goal of event eventually creating something that was marketable for our members, right? So we went through all of the steps and one of the insights that came out is people don't always feel comfortable talking about wellness at work. They don't feel like it's the place for it. You know, maybe work's not the place to come in and say, geez, guys, I had a rough weekend, I ate like 10 bags of Doritos, I kind of fell off the wagon, right? So people don't want to talk about that at work. That was one of the insights. So this idea came up, uh, a wellness whiteboard. And the idea was that people would, ha everybody would get a whiteboard to post outside of their cubicle or their office, and they could write their wellness goals to create conversation. Oh, hey, Julie, I didn't hear you a marathon, me too, maybe we could train together, right? Yeah, I wish. Uh, okay, so that's, that was the idea. Before we invested money in getting these whiteboards made, we prototyped them by just hanging up pieces of paper outside of cubes and offices and saying, guys, write your wellness goals up. And um, one of the insights we found by prototyping is that it was too open-ended. People were like, well, what do you mean by wellness goals? What do you mean by that? So we ended up adding uh, prompts. This week for fitness, I will, dot, dot, dot. Uh, food and nutrition, dot, dot, dot. So people would have a prompt. Oh, okay, food and nutrition. I wrote on mine, I'm going to stop drinking soda. Challenge completed, by the way. So th that's how that worked. The prototype served to see if people would actually use these things and write on them. And yeah, they did, but we found, okay, there's a tweak we have to make. Yeah, so that's the prototyping piece. And once you have a prototype, you have to test it and then refine it. Yeah? So my, my first example here is of what not to do. I just found this too interesting to not include. Uh, Franz Reichelt uh, was a Parisian tailor and he invented the coat parachute. Have you guys seen these in stores? Ah, oh, there's a reason for that. Franz decided he was going to test his coat parachute in 1912 on February 4th by jumping off the Eiffel Tower. It was Franz's last day. Uh, not a good way to test. So Franz went whole hog. He put that bad boy on and he climbed up the Eiffel Tower and he jumped off and, and that was the end of Franz. He is no more, nor is the coat parachute. So that's the way to not test, right? That's a great example of how not to test something. When we talk about testing, we say, what pieces can you test? How can you break this idea apart and test pieces of it instead of jumping in all the way? So a great example of testing pieces comes from Zappos. Do you guys know this story? This is a great story. So uh, the creator of Zappos, days of the internet, right? So he wanted to know, will people buy shoes sight unseen? Will this happen, right? So what he did is he went to a local shoe store and he said, can I take pictures of some of your inventory and put them online? And if people want to buy them, I will come back to your store, I will purchase the shoes and mail them out. So he was able, without creating, uh, without creating a whole large operation, without getting a warehouse and filling it with merchandise and doing all of this, able to test one piece of his idea, which is, will people buy shoes? The answer was yes. Spoiler alert. Yeah, so he was able to test one piece of the idea rather than testing the full thing like Franz did. I'm going to go up and I'm going to jump off the Eiffel Tower. Uh, one of the things that we tested that I, I wanted to talk about with you guys is this idea of a welcome surprise. So when we first started thinking about innovation, one of the first projects we worked on was customer experience related. We thought, well, that's an easy one to get our feet wet because we should always be improving our customer experience. One of the things we thought about was for new members. Now, if anyone's gotten a card from us, uh, don't throw it away because it's in a plain white envelope with no marks on it and you will have no idea what it is. And you might accidentally throw it into the junk mail because there's nothing to identify it as a card, an insurance card. So we thought, well, one of the insights was people like, uh, people like surprises. A lot of people like surprises. And when you enroll in insurance, I already mentioned, the only thing you really get is that card. So you've just put out a lot of money or you've just committed for the year and you're not actually getting anything right away in return. You're getting a card. So what came up was this idea of including a surprise in your welcome kit. So instead of just sending a card, sending a lot of health information as well as a little bit of a surprise. So the way we, or the way we tested that rather is we did this with about 10,000 of our small group members 
What we sent them with the insurance card was a free song download. So, or I think it was three songs. So they got, a call, they got their insurance card, and then they got this really nice looking, I wish I had a picture of it, uh, fold out that had flaps. And on each flap, there was uh, information about health, and then they could go on to download their free songs. When they went on to download their free songs, they could also click to download more health information. And there was a 30% click-through rate, which is a pretty high click-through rate when you're talking about people going onto a website. So we tried it with that market. Uh, ultimately, we didn't decide to go whole hog with it because it, the, the cost was a little prohibitive, but that's one way we tested it to see, is this something that works? Is it something that makes sense that we want to pursue on a larger scale? Right? So that's all about testing. So those are kind of the five stages uh, that, that we use when we think about innovation and how we can think about things in new ways, how we can achieve things in new ways. And um, really quickly, I'll talk about innovation in the community and how we're thinking about this outside of our walls. When my team came on board, we were initially all about internal, how we work with our associates. And we still do that, but we've realized there's a big opportunity outside of our walls uh, because one of the biggest tenets of innovation if there were commandments, the first one would be, thou shalt collaborate. You have to collaborate, right? You can't achieve anything by yourselves. Well, you can achieve some things, but not a lot because you're only working on your own insight, your own input, right? And you really have to have open innovation, which is in and out of your walls, to get what you need, right? Mm. Sorry, I'm working a bit of a cold. So, uh, so we had to collaborate. We had to think more about how we collaborate. How do we do this? And one of the biggest ways we've achieved this is through partnerships. So partnerships, namely with schools and universities, uh, we've, I'll tell you in a moment about that, schools and universities, uh, with doctors and hospitals, and with our members, right? So three main buckets of, of partnership. And in terms of schools and universities, uh, we look a lot to not only Jefferson, but to Philadelphia University. So Philly U has a program called the Strategic Design MBA, and it blends design thinking with your traditional MBA. It's one of few in the country. There were three in the country in 2014. I'm not sure if that's changed. So it's this, this groundbreaking program that thinks about design in a new way, in a business context, right? So we partner with Philly U to put on events all the time. We actually had uh, some of their professors come in to teach our associates some concepts from their MBA program. So really, really interesting stuff going on there. We partner with Jefferson uh, in wonderful ways, and I'll talk about that momentarily. And we're partnering with our members. So a lot of the organizations that have our coverage, places like SEPTA, uh, SEPTA has just named a head of innovation. Uh, the Free Library of Philadelphia, part of the city, right? So the city is thinking a lot about innovation. So we're now thinking about them and how we partner with them and what we can do with them to continue to share this mindset and create collaboration across all kinds of networks. Uh, so the first thing I'll mention, uh, I'm going to give you three examples of, of ways that we're working in the community to innovate. There was an event called Global Service Jam. Uh, this happens every year. If you guys don't know about it, it's coming up for this year. So check it out. Global Service Jam is basically a big idea session that happens across the world. So last year, I think 56 places participated, and we're talking about uh, Germany, towns in Germany are participating, uh, Sri Lanka, all over the world there are people ideating around the same one topic over the course of a weekend. So the way Global Service Jam works is that on Friday night they release the topic, anyone who's signed up to participate in that given city gets together, they ideate, and then at the end of the weekend they have to upload their prototype to the Global Service Jam site. Well, as of 2014, Philadelphia had never participated. Uh, Boston, New York, they all had Global Service Jam sites and we didn't, which was a crying shame. So last year we hosted Global Service Jam for the first year. We had about 12 people over the course of the weekend working on this. The prompt last year, do you guys remember, I think they're called cootie catchers. When you're kids, do you remember the things that you make decisions with? Remember this? I'm taking you back, right? That was the prompt last year. That was what we had to ideate around. Something completely crazy, right? One of the teams in our, in our building came up with an idea for a pop-up tent for homeless folks that had this, was inspired by this shape or this kind of a, a setup, right? So that's what Global Service Jam is all about. That's one of the ways we're, we're getting ideation out in the community, thinking about how we improve things, how we create services and goods and products uh, that can change somebody's life. 
Uh, the next one is the IVX Jeff Health Hack. So anybody here at the Hackathon? I know Julie was. Oh, you guys were all at the Hackathon. Amazing. So we had our first health hack in November of 2015. It was phenomenal, uh, thanks in large part to Donna, who did almost all of the work with the students. Um, the students did a tremendous job putting on, yeah, and Bon Koo. Bon is phenomenal. If you guys know Bon, he's ridiculous. He's the best person ever. Uh, so we had this health hack. We had over 100 participants right down the street, and it was really using a lot of the tenants that I just talked about. It was getting people in the door, having them frame problems, having them do research to better understand those problems. A lot of times they were coming in wanting to frame a problem based on a need that they had themselves or that somebody in their families had. So I, ha I have somebody in my family with diabetes, and I want to figure out how to, how to make things better for them through wearables, right? So we had this health hack to have people start thinking about ideas. At the end of the weekend, there were over 30 pitches. It was phenomenal. And a lot of the teams are still working on their inventions that they came up with. And then the last one I'll talk about is Philly Tech Week. So we participated in Philly Tech Week last year to get people together thinking about how technology can improve healthcare. How do we use technology to improve healthcare? Um, and these are just three examples of getting folks in the community together, using some of the principles I talked about to create new ideas and better ways of life. Right? That's really what it comes down to at the end. I, I was just listening to a talk the other day, and, and it's really about creating something that will change something for someone in the better, right? It goes kind of back to that segue example. You can create something new, but if it's not going to improve somebody's life in some way, is it really going to have a resounding effect? Probably not, right? Uh, so let me just check on my time here. We're almost done, guys. I want to give you one last example that it was just too good to not include. And it, it talks about all of the, the things we've gone through. So have you heard the Shreddies example? Have the major oh, excellent. OK. So Shreddies is a cereal in the UK. There's an amazing TED talk on this. I wanted to play it, but it was a little too long. So there's a great TED talk. Check that out afterwards. Shreddies was a cereal in the UK. And they brought in a project team to uh, think about how they could increase sales. Because Shreddies was loved, loved by many, but mostly by older people. And they had the insight that their customer base was literally dying out, yeah? So they had to increase sales. They needed to do something because they thought, well, old people love us, but for not much longer. So how do we increase our sales? And when the team came in, they did the framing and the scoping with the project sponsors and found out that the constraints were they couldn't change anything about the brand. Yeah, so figure that one out. Uh, people loved Shreddies, and they didn't want to change anything about the brand, but they had to somehow increase sales. Yeah, so they went through ideation. They had hundreds of ideas. They had very little budget to work with. They went through all of this, and then somebody had an idea. Uh, based on, they were sitting in a meeting. They were looking at the cereal. Shreddies were, you can't really see this picture. This shows you how old this cereal is. They're these little square wheat bits, yeah? And somebody in one of the meetings turned it on its end and said, oh, Shreddies could be diamonds. And the new campaign was Diamond Shreddies. I kid you not. This is what the team came up with. And they tested it in the market. So they prototyped the diamond by turning the Shreddy on its side. And they tested it in the market. And it got an amazing response. So they launched new Diamond Shreddies. Sales went up, uh, market share went up 18 points in the first month of the campaign. Diamond Shreddies, I kid you not. And part of it was because consumers were in on the joke. They knew they didn't really change anything, but they liked this kind of cheeky marketing campaign of Diamond Shreddies, new and improved. Uh, and there's, there are articles about this. There are TED Talks about it. It's, it's a really interesting case study. You should check it out, read through it more. I couldn't, I would be remiss to not talk about Shreddies because I love it so much. But it goes through all of the things that we talked about, right? So they had to do a lot of framing with the sponsors up front to understand what were the constraints in place. Okay, they couldn't change the brand. They had to go through ideation. They went through rounds and rounds and rounds of ideation. And then it was just that little boop, oh, oh, it's a diamond now, right? That made it really different and really interesting and actually had the result they needed. And, and once they tested it, they found out that, yeah, this was the thing that did it. This is what saved shreddies, diamond shreddies. So uh, eat your shreddies. And uh, with that, if there are any questions, this is my contact information. Uh, and I'd love to hear any questions you guys have. Stay here and answer. Anyone have a question they want to pose to Michelle? Hang on one hey. Let me give you the microphone so everyone can hear you. So how long did that effect last? The Shreddies effect? Yeah, yeah it continued. Uh, it, it continued, and I, I don't remember off the top of my... 
I have to write numbers down because I don't remember them, but it continued. They continue doing well in their sales and they're still around today. Mm, anyone else? Question? Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. In a lot of your examples, can people hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in a lot of your examples, it sounds like um, you've had a lot of involvement from uh, associates at IBX. Yeah. And I'm curious if you have any um, suggestions or insights of, you know, how did you get that? How did you get people to put the paper up with the wellness goals or yeah. uh, get them to go into their neighborhoods and interview people? How do you sort of um, recruit those people? Great question. Yeah. So we, we are working a lot with our associates. We do use them a lot for the work that we do. And it's, it's funny. We have found that associates at a certain level really want to get involved, right? When you tell people you have the chance to do innovation, they're like, great. I don't know what that means, but I'm in, right? So people are really excited to learn a new skill set, to do something new. And we've created a whole program for our associates with training, with speakers. Um, we have something called Coffee Talk, which is like a book club without the wine. Uh, so they can talk about articles and books and things like that. So we've created a whole program designed to get our associates more entrenched in innovation and thinking about innovation. And what we found is that people are really excited to learn. They're really excited to develop themselves themselves. Now, interestingly, a lot of the charge is coming from the top for us. So we have a CEO who's amazing, and he really buys into innovation and really wants us to be an innovative company. A lot of his direct reports feel the same way. And then a lot of the frontline associates really want to get involved in innovation. The sticking point is middle management. The middle management is always the challenge for us because they're the folks who are close to the everyday fires and they're kind of going, well, we don't have time for innovation. We're dealing with nonsense all day long. And you know, the folks at the top aren't seeing it at the same level, so they don't see it that way. And what we've been trying to say is, listen, we're not giving you something else to do. We're telling you a better, smarter way to do what you have to do already, right? So we've slowly but surely been chipping away at that middle management level. We haven't totally cracked it yet, but we're, we're getting there. Hi, uh, I was actually wondering if uh, you guys, are you guys at IBX still looking for other schools to partner with? Yeah, so we're actually, last year, uh, in 2015, we started to create a university strategy so that we could understand how to best partner with all of the schools in the area. We're such a university-rich area that we really want to be able to maximize opportunities, whether it's you know, uh, through speaking opportunities, through having students come in to work on projects. We've been looking to figure out exactly how we formalize that and what it looks like because, you know, I think one thing for us, a big opportunity for us is to have students come in and give us input. Um, it goes back to, you know, not thinking we know everything and, and being really open about innovation and, and getting insight from everywhere. And then we recognize there's a big opportunity for the students to get hands-on experience by working with actual business problems. So we're figuring out now how we, how we formalize that, but we've done some work with other universities on that and some project work and things like that. If you have ideas, we'd love to hear them. Hi there. So Hi. Corporate culture is, is very hard to change. It is. One of the limiting factors for insurance companies is referring to payouts on claims as losses. It would be wonderful if they could refer to them as benefits. Mm. I think that would change many attitudes and make the experience with the insurance company pleasant rather than unpleasant. So how would you go about trying to make that happen yep. in a giant corporation like Blue Cross? Yeah, so that's a great point. We actually talk about language a lot. Uh, we have a tool that we call language of love, and it, it is. It's all around language and understanding that language can have a really big impact on what you do. And uh, really quickly, I'll come back to talk about us in just a minute, but um, Kaiser Permanente is a healthcare company out on the West Coast, and Kaiser did something interesting. They stopped calling their patients patients. They call them guests, and they started to look at their rooms as guest rooms, like at a hotel. So it's changing kind of that language to shift the mindset and the perception. And you're right, corporate culture is incredibly challenging to crack, which is why I feel comfortable I'll have a job for a really long time, uh, because it's going to take many, many, many years. But part of what we're doing is trying to change things exactly like that. So the way we're doing it is really starting with our, our kind of C-suite and saying, guys, you know, we need to think about it this way instead of this way, and starting to shift language and attitudes 
and perceptions into how we talk about things, right? So um, we're doing that through a lot of the challenges that we do, through a lot of the work that we do internally. Uh, I would say everything we do, everything my team works on, we always have an executive sponsor. And we always look for an executive sponsor who's willing to influence his peers, his or her peers, right? So we're always trying to shift that attitude and perception, and we're doing it through the work that we do. And that's, you know, it, it, it will be a continuing battle. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll mention, just in terms of shifting culture, one of the ways we've been measuring that is through... Um, associate engagement surveys. So we do an annual engagement survey, and we're able to see, do people feel like we're changing? Do people feel like we're shifting? Do people feel like we are, in fact, an innovative company to work through, for? And that's been through our surveys. Yeah, any other questions? Anybody else? So just a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, I want to uh, give a shout out to our folks from Abington uh, who are streaming. And um, I apologize that we didn't in advance make, uh, create some mechanism by which you could uh, email us uh, or text us questions. But Michelle has been good enough to put up her, uh, her email and her Twitter account. So you can tweet her a question, you can email a question, and she'll follow up with you. She's quite the tweeter. Email it. <laughs> email it, OK. Um, I, I'm kind of a tweeter. I'm, I'm, I'm at like 100 followers. I'm getting pretty legit now. <laughs> Um, I just want to say a couple of words about the Independence Jefferson collaboration. So, so this speaker series is a part of that, and we have a, a number of other components that we have been working on and developing and rolling out. The hackathon was our first big event together. Um, it was pretty extraordinary. Jeff was uh, advising one of the one of the winning teams, um, and I think um, one of the things that that uh, spoke to us in that process was that we're really on to something. It's, 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 it's very challenging and fun, um, and it requires a lot of intensity and energy, but, but I think we're really on to something here, and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna keep at it. So we're gonna continue to create as many different opportunities for engagement as, as, we, can, as we can manage. Um, so uh, we're gonna continue our tradition of lunch over at the Jazz, and uh, you're welcome to, to join us. And, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, Michelle will be around for questions and lunch, and and uh, and thank you all for for being here for the for the first go around of the next speaker engagement series, the Independence Jefferson collaboration. Thanks very much. <laughs>